all right? Who thinks Star Wars is better than Star Trek? You're all wrong, because Doctor Who wins. Well played. Yeah. We had, a, we had an internal Microsoft event where everyone goes to Redmond and the product team show us uh, what's coming so we can prepare and that sort of thing. And to get everyone excited, they had uh, a guy dressed up as Master Chief Halo, right? And they had really realistic, real weapons, you know, toy weapons, but they looked very realistic. He had Marines uh, dro uh, drop soldiers with him and stuff like that. And they came running into the... the um, the, the hall, which had probably 2,000 people in it, and it was a, uh, a demo smackdown where people were doing demos to beat each other. This is how we get excited at Microsoft, is uh, do demos against each other. And he came running in, and a lot of our employees from around the world got really scared because in some countries, when people run in the room with guns, it's kind of for real. <laughs> um, so the next, they do that session twice a day, so the next session they did it, they had to come in with bananas instead of guns. What's the unit test on explosive dog testing? Like, boom, all right, you pass, but now it's done. Did your mom let you do that, lick the beater? Yep. Yeah. Great moms turn them off first. <laughs> Has anyone seen this before? No. With the, uh, I've seen that in real life, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is bad grammar. We consume more than 400 Africans. I think, I think it's we consume more than 400 Africans consume. But. <laughs> this is not US. You can tell by the signs. It's probably Russia. If they can't survive that, they're out. <laughs> this, I'm totally, you know, I'm totally getting a good, because the zombie apocalypse is coming. Don't doubt it. I, if you have a teenage child, you know what I mean, because they're like. <laughs> Come on in. The first three rows are the splash zone. After that, it's safe. You'll be okay. That's just a really creepy band from the 70s. That's, you know that guy with the beard? He has like a kid locked up in his basement or something like that. Okay, one, one more. Then we have to get started. That one's not funny. Here we go. Did, did you remember, we had a senator that, that said the internet was just a bunch of tubes that got plugged up. So that's what the internet looks like. I just try to download a fresh copy of the internet every morning, then I'm good to go. All right, we're going to get started. Welcome to the last session of Dev DevReach. And this is always a sad time at any conference. Your brain's full, you're tired, you've made friends, you didn't have to work for two days, and then you have to go back to reality and... And all that. So we're going to talk about soft skills, which is a weird thing to talk about at a technical conference because we're all about learning languages and prototypes and the latest shiny bullet and all of that stuff. And it, it turns out that even as nerds, we need soft skills to be successful in our career. Before I have been at Microsoft for about five years now. Before that, I had my own startup company, uh, sold that to a giant con soulless conglomerate, worked for an e-commerce company where I built software that drove the color of the skin of chicken based on where you live, or the color of salmon as you grow it. So we could hack the color of salmon. That was kind of neat. And then I, then I worked for, uh, then I built a consulting firm uh, for another company, and then I joined Microsoft. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about a lot of the lessons that I've learned in my career, 
And uh, as I was leading my la leaving my last company, I was trying to pass these lessons on as tribal knowledge to the younger developers in our company is to kind of help them along. And someone said, you should do that. You should give that at a conference. And I've since, I think, given this talk maybe 150 times. There are four hours of material here. And we're going to stay here for all four hours. We'll probably stop in an hour. Uh, so let, let's get started. Uh, you guys already knew who I am. OK. So who knows George Jetson? Who can sing the song? Yeah, no one ever answers that. All right. So this was my first lesson. Right out of college, I, I joined the, the government, uh, the state of Ohio government, working for an arts organization. So we would take government money and spend that on arts, all sorts of arts, uh, real arts like ballet and opera, all the way to perform crazy performance art where like a lady would paint cats in the park. Like that, I, well, I don't judge. We just gave money. And I built this whole new system for them. They had all these databases. Anyone do Paradox for DOS? Anyone old enough to know what that is? And they had databases over there, three different accounting systems. And I said, well, I'm going to write one system to rule them all. And I even used a Tolkien reference, and none of them got it because they're all artists. And uh, I wrote this one system, and it integrated everything, and it was beautiful. For example, it took a report that they had to give to the government uh, once a quarter that said what money they spent on what projects. This report, I'm sorry, annually, it would take... Uh, four people, six weeks to put this report together. So real big project. If this person was working on a report and they came up to you, you had to drop everything you were doing and help them with this report. So in the new system, this report took one person, 15 minutes, next, 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 finish. Right? Very easy. Report was done. And I was showing it to them. And we were launching the, the application and getting it out. And I was demoing this new report capability. I thought, this was amazing. I went from four people for six weeks, or six people for four weeks. It was a lot of man effort, a lot of work hours, to 15 minutes. And if you did that at work, what do you think you would get as a reward? More work. More work, yeah. <laughs> you work for the government, don't you? <laughs> Anyone else? I, I was young. I was naive, fresh out of college. I thought you'd get a parade or maybe a cake, something, a pat on the back, something like that. Uh, and, and while I was demoing it, I, I said, it's going to be like, I literally said this, it's going to be like George Jetson when I'm done. You're going to come in and push the button, and all your work is going to be done for you. Because George Jetson would only push his button like once a day when he went to work, if he ever went to work. <laughs> and you would not believe how angry these people got. Right? Here I am bringing fire to the caveman, and, uh, and they just got very upset. Very, 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 like I ran to my office and hid upset. And when my boss kind of calmed them down and got the torches put away and the pitchforks put away, <laughs> I, I said, what did I do wrong? And she said, you threatened their jobs. You told them their jobs were going away. And I said, well, I was just telling them about how the technology works. And she goes, they don't, oh, I'm missing a slide. That's going to ruin everything. Um, they don't care about the technology. I thought, what do you mean they don't care about technology? My life is technology. They better damn well care about technology because I do. And she said, no. So what do you think humans actually care about? What's that? Go ahead. This is the interactive portion of the show. Feel free. Let it out. Ice cream. Ice, they care about ice cream. <laughs> or it's a, an interface of scream. No, it's, uh, they care about the results, right? They care about the business results of that technology. They don't care about the technology itself. And, she, and I said, well, what did you say to calm them down? She said, what Brian meant to say was that his software is going to reduce the amount of work you have so you have more time to spend with the artists to help them craft uh, their plans and to help them build their, their businesses, if, if you will, as an artist and less time doing paperwork. I thought, well, that was brilliant. I should have I've said that. So I, I learned early on that you have to tie everything you do in technology back to what the real benefit is for the human, not the benefit to us, because we don't care. We're, we're, we're hired to do the hard work. My next job, I had some very good uh, mentors. And I, I learned that you should always, always have a mentor. And that shouldn't be in technology, because we probably learn technology really well. We're technologists, we kind of pick it up. And it's easy for us to come to a conference like this and, uh, and learn what we need to do. So you need to get uh, mentors 
in skills that you don't easily learn, like sales, like communications, like marketing, like business management, like accounting. And the more you learn about those other aspects, the better developer you will be. Because the best developer isn't the guy who can write the best code. The best developer who can write the best code for the business problem they're solving. And to be able to do that, you have to understand the business. And to do that, you have to understand how that works. So I used to go on sales calls with our salespeople. And we had an acronym for the salespeople in our dev department. We called them BDAs, Big Dumb Animals. Because <laughs> they would call you up and go, what password do I log in again? Oh my god, come on. It's not that hard. It's just TCP IP. And, um, and so they would show up. I, don't, I think it's pretty common everywhere you go. You go to an office building to visit a customer, and you have to sign in in a little guest book in the front for security. And, uh, and they would flip around the book like they were lost. Like, dude, you append to the end of the log. That's how it works, right? And they're flipping around. And, and I, I comment on this like, uh, Tim, you, you should know how to sign the guest book. He goes, no, I'm flipping around because I want to see what other salespeople from other, what other companies have been in here and who are they talking to, right? And then we would get into this meeting. And I would want to launch into how awesome Agile is and how we can build a, a really great web application for them. And they would spend the whole hour talking about American football. I can guarantee you that I care about American football as about as much as you care about American football, <laughs> which is zero. You want to talk about Halo? I'm in, right? Borderlands 2, totally all over that. I'm like, and so I, I'm out of the, on the way out of the meeting, I'm like, dude, all we did was talk about sports. You didn't even engage me. We really missed an opportunity here. He goes, no, 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 no. You can't just start with the sell. You, they're not going to buy from you if you start there because you're pushing on them. You have to start, which I've sensed to come the re, call the relationship pie. You have to start the, the crust, the yummy, yummy crust, is... Uh, made from a common ground of understanding. So we all have something in common. What do you think that is? Star Wars, that's right. <laughs> and, but in this meeting, the sales guy's trying to figure out what they have in common, what they can talk about. It might be golf, it might be football, it might be children, whatever that is. And they talk about that and they start building that relationship. And over several sales calls, they will eventually get to understanding what the customer is about, the customer understanding what we are, and they will eventually start buying from us instead of us selling to them. Right? I learned a lot about uh, business management and stuff like that. So always have a mentor. Watch what they're doing. Almost be a stalker about it. You can, it people, will, uh, people will be very pleased if you ask them if, you, if they can be your mentor. Could you please mentor me in, in this or that? And keep learning different skills outside of technology. We got the technology thing down. We own the space. We already rule the planet. We just haven't told the humans yet. We have to learn all that other stuff, the reason we keep them around. Discard them as needed. If you've learned, be nice about it. Don't just call I dispose. And um, say, you know, I, I've learned what he can teach me about sales or marketing or what communications PR. Let me find out what this person now can teach me. And if they're outside your org, that's even great. That's even better because they have a different perspective on things. And you want to try to pick that up and learn it. One of my earliest mentors uh, ended up being my uh, business partner was uh, George Henry. Much older guy, a lawyer. And we worked for a very small firm, an insurance firm. We had only about $20 million annual turnover or gross revenue. And, and we would uh, write insurance policies from a bigger company that has billion dollars, billion, many billions of dollars in sales who shared a building with the Taco Bell headquarters. So you could go down and like to their test kitchen and eat some really weird stuff. And we would go, he was a master of, of body language. And body language, believe it or not, uh, 95, 98% of communication is body language. It's not verbal, which completely explains why I can talk to my cat. <laughs> and uh, and um, so we have to be aware that we're giving off these signals and that people are interpreting them. And we have to be aware that we can read other people's signals. And now that there's a signal and communication in play, what do we do as developers? We hack it. So now we're going to specifically, consciously give off certain body signals, uh, body language to people, to get them to react to us in a certain way. So if you go to your boss and you say, boss, I would like $10,000 to fly to Atlanta, Georgia, in the USA to go to TechEd 
and I need an airplane and a rental car and hotel and tech ed tickets are expensive and I need a, uh, an assistant to come with me. And he's going, what's that body language mean? No. no. This is also a defensive stance. So if you're, if you're trying to convince something, someone of something and they're like this, they're, they're probably being very defensive or they're being very cold. If it's, it's not very cold here in Bulgaria, but where I live, we grew up, we'd have two meters of snow. You spend a lot of time like this. <laughs> he had some other great things, and uh, I wish we could spend hours talking about body language alone. It's a cool kind of dark art, black science. So we would go into a, a conference room to negotiate with this big insurance company for how the deal revenue would get split. And the big insurance company says, this is a small company from Ohio. They probably live in a cornfield with pigs and uh, we're just gonna walk all over them. So the first rule is you gotta own the turf first. So we would get to the meeting 10 minutes early. And, and some companies, negotiation-wise, they like to show up a little bit late. If they're the last guys in the room, they think they can then control uh, the meeting from there. So I guess there's two opposing views there. So we would get there early. And at a normal, th imagine, if you will, there's a conference room table here, and there's a chair at either end, and then there's two chairs on the sides, right? Typical layout. Now, how does a normal, if you have two teams negotiating, how do you think you, where does the leader for team A sit? Here. Here, that's right. Come up here, please. You're now in the demo. All right. Thank you, sir. What's your name? Dan. I can't pronounce that. Okay, so. <laughs> Dell, like the computer? Dean, Dean. Dean, like Dean, Dean. Martin. Yeah, All right, yeah. rock on. Okay. Where does the other team leader sit normally? Don't cheat. You're up on the demo. Where? <laughs> Right here, right? So you're, come, come up here, you're gonna be in the demo too. You're a Microsoft student partner, right? Of course. All right, I won't ask you your name because I probably won't be able to pronounce it, unless it's in German. All right, so where does, uh, Dean, right? Yeah. Where does Dean's right-hand man, where does his assistant, primary assistant sit? Right here. Come on up, sir. <laughs> Very dapper looking gentleman. What's your name? Casimir. Casimir, all right, nice to meet you, I'm Brian. Nice. Thanks for coming. So that's why we get the saying, right-hand man. And Dean can lean over to him and go, what do you think, right? And they, they have a power couple. They have a power, not like uh, superstars yeah. or anything. <laughs> but you have a, a relationship going. You have a block of power down here. And where do you think your assistant sits? To your right hand. So who wants to be his assistant? All right, come on up. All right. Are you an MSP too? Yeah. All right. You all cool. are. You all are. Everyone here? <laughs> Oh, just the four of you, okay. No, you're, you have to stand there. That's where the chair is. All right, so now we have, and we might have other people sitting here and right there. These are the secondary, this is where the nerds usually sit because it's a boss, lawyer, nerd. That's how it goes. <laughs> and uh, so what we're gonna do, you're gonna go off stage. You're the big bad company, so please go off stage a little bit. You too, you're part of the bad company. Uh, bad Wolf Inc., right, from Doctor Who. And then uh, we're gonna be the good guys. So you're gonna come off okay. stage here and I'm getting in front of the speaker, so I'm gonna move. And uh, we would get in there early. So the boss would come in and sit where the boss is supposed to sit. And he would say, Brian, I want you, his right-hand man would still stand there, but he would send the nerd to sit in the other guy's right-hand chair seat. <laughs> now the bad boss comes in, and before the meeting, he has told his right-hand man and his nerd, you sit where you're supposed to sit and don't talk unless I look at you. That's how this works. <laughs> So then he comes in to sit on the right-hand man, and you pretend you're me. For now, I'm going to pretend I'm you. And he comes in, and he, he's like, oh, he's in my seat. I'll play it cool. Maybe he'll get up and move, because that's where I'm supposed to sit. And the meeting's about to start, and he's not moving, because he's really rude. <laughs> so he goes into Rain Man mode. You guys know the movie Rain Man? Ah, it's time for Wapner, 347 toothpicks. And he doesn't where to sit, and finally he gets embarrassed, and he sits down here with the other team. <laughs> oh, my God. And we've now broken up that power couple. And then we get whatever we want. And that's how it works. So thank you guys, take a bow. So Broadway is calling you. So um, if you disrupt what they expect. And, and so how many of you have like a team meeting and people always sit in the same chairs every meeting, right? Just go sit in someone else's chair. It's like, oh, what, is this your chair? Is your, what are you, four? And they'll get all upset. And that's the other thing. You've ever seen in a, in a meeting people lean on the table into the table like this? I pretend I'm sitting at a con. What do you think that means? They're interested. Uh, maybe. 
right? It mean, they're, they're injecting energy into the conversation. They're projecting almost aggressively into the conversation sometimes. And things would get really stressful. And George had this great, this is how I started watching him for body language. Is, and I've never seen anyone do this. He sits in his chair, typical office chair. And normally you sit like this or like this or you're leaning in because you're aggressive. He would lean back and just put his arms outside the, like this. <laughs> and it is, try doing that in a meeting. It's really weird because you feel naked, right? You have no defenses. I don't have arms to hide behind or a book. And, he, and when you do that, all the stress goes out of the meeting. Suddenly the people you're talking to, well, if he's not defensive... I shouldn't be excited. So when things start getting tense and excited, just lean back and put your arms out, and you will feel very uncomfortable. You have to force yourself to do this, and all the tension goes out of the room. So um, unless you're playing World of Warcraft, but <laughs> a lot of great body language stuff going on. I've had a lot of mentors over the time, uh, as you can see here, and I just want to point out that Darth Maul does not work at Microsoft. <laughs> he uh, works at Google now. So. <laughs> Rails are cool, uh, Ruby on Rails is cool, but you don't want your career to ride on Rails. You don't want to forget about your career. You get so excited about your, so busy with your job, you forget about your career. And the job is just one part of your career. Your career is your story of your professional life. What do I really want to do with that? And a job is just a little piece of it. It's, it should, should support where you want to go in your career. And if you forget about that, you get so baked in your job that you wake up 10 years later in the same cube with the same computer doing the same thing, and you're like, what? Like you woke up from a dream, like, what just happened? Where, now I'm way behind on things, and I'm out of the loop. I'm not saying you have to get new jobs all the time, but you have to pay attention to your career, because your boss doesn't care about your career. Your boss cares about your job. Are you doing your job? Are you trained for that job? Are you executing on that job? They don't care about your, your, your goals, your career goals. So you have to manage your own career. You have to think of yourself as your own consultant, and if you work for a company full-time, you merely have a long-term contract with them, right? And, but I still have to manage my career. And so I'm an Agilist. I love Agile. I do everything Agile. We ran our business in an Agile way. Even the accounting department, which totally freaked them out. But we got them to do it, and they were very successful. So the first thing I want to do is once a year, I don't do this every week because it would, take, it would take too much, but once, maybe twice a year, I'm very introspective on where I am with my career. What did I do in the past year? What do I hope to do in the next year? Was I happy? Are those still meeting my goals? Those sorts of things. You have to be very honest with yourself. And I spend a whole day doing this. I take a day off from work. To my wife, it looks like I'm playing Xbox. But <laughs> it's, it's very important that you actually do this. And you have to think what your goals are. And they have to be, you have to start with your outer goal first and work in. Right? So I have to start with my 10-year goal and then define a goal maybe at five years that supports the 10-year goal and then a three-year goal that supports the five-year goal. If I do it the other way around, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm building a tower in the wrong way. So you have to say, like, well, maybe in 10 years, I want to be a director of development. Today, and that may change a year from now, but right now, I want to be a director of development in 10 years. To do that, managing big, lots of several teams, I have to have experience managing a very large project worth a couple million of dollars. And so that's my five-year goal, is to be uh, a big project engineering lead. Uh, we used to call them uh, project engineers, managing that, uh, uh, you know, a team of eight people with uh, a couple million dollar budget. Well, in order to do that, I have to be a senior developer. That's my three-year goal. In order to be a senior developer, I need to do this, this, and this in my organization. I have to ship quality code all the time and go to awesome conferences. <laughs> so you set those goals, and then you uh, set a plan, and then you execute that plan. So, I'm, so now that I got my goals, I'm going to try to do my senior development plan, try to do that. What does that mean in my company? Let my boss know that's what I want to do. I'm now a developer. I want to be a senior developer. And beyond getting older, what does that mean? And then we have to iterate. Maybe every six months, probably every 12 months, no more than that, because you don't want to churn, you don't want to thrash in your career too much. You're going to take those goals, and you're going to write them on a sticky note, and put them on your monitor right below the sticky note with your password. You're going to put them right there, so you see them every day. Because if you don't, you'll get so busy fighting fires at work that you'll forget about your job, career and you'll start only working on your job. And if you don't want people to know what those are, put them in code. Write them in Klingon, because I'm sure you all know that. Or do you know something that reminds you of that. Me and my wife, we do this with our personal goals as well for our family. And we put those up on our refrigerator. 
our refrigerator in the kitchen, and, and the kids know about what our goals are, and we talk about that. And that's one of the ways that we're uh, teaching them to uh, be agile developers when they're nine. <laughs> when you're doing this, you have to invest in your own career, and you're all doing that today. Most of you are probably getting paid, take, took, took some day, days off of work to be here, but you're probably still getting paid by your boss. But that might mean going to school at night or doing uh, MOOC courses online, uh, online courses. Um, the most important thing you can do is just download technology and play with it. Or contribute to an open source project. Uh, on my old consulting team, uh, you had to show some passion for the community. And one of the ways to do that was to contribute to an open source project. It doesn't have to be in Hibernate writing super low level code. It can be anything that, that you want to contribute to. Going to speaking at assisting and volunteering at code camps. You don't have to be the smartest guy in the room to run the code camp or the conference. You just have to be a guy who wants to learn and help other people learn. And I believe every developer should have their own blog, their own professional blog. You may not blog every day. You may not have a lot of readers. It's probably your mom and your cat. But <laughs> when you solve a problem and Bing didn't solve it for you, you should write a post and put it on your blog so that Bing, all right, you can use Google if you want. Um, just Google it with Bing if you, yeah. But uh, then, then you've contributed to the internet and our collective knowledge. And I swear to God, one time I had a problem with SharePoint. I'm, I know it's rare like that. But I had a problem with SharePoint. And I'm, I'm searching and I'm searching and I'm searching. And I found a guy who wrote an article that fixed my problem. It was me, my own blog two years ago. <laughs> it's like, this guy is awesome. So I wrote myself a comment. You're awesome. Check out my blog. When I hired my team, when I was running my own consulting firm, there were three things that I looked for. And these are three things that you should focus on when you're looking for a job. And you should be looking for an employer that's looking for these things, if that makes any sense. If I could be any more recursive, I, I would be. <laughs> any idea what these three things are? I'm required by the speakers union to take three responses. So first? Motivation. Uh, very close, very close. Yes, sir. I look for a smart. Yeah? Yes? Uh -huh. Smart, get things done. And responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got one of them nailed. Any others? I need a third. Fashion? Fashion. Oh, passion. Damn. Fashion is actually number four. Uh, so you guys, you, I, I have to say, you were probably the best audience. Most people were like, how well do you know the CLR? How many languages do you know? How many plugins in Firefox do you install? It's passion, <coughs> problem solving, and learning. As developers, we solve problems. That's what we do. Now, I'm talking only to the men in the audience here, which in an American audience is usually 99% of the audience. Uh, when your wife or girlfriend or fiance or partner talks to you about a problem they have at work or a bad day they had, they don't want you to problem solve. <laughs> Been married 14 years, figured that out a couple weeks ago. Uh, they want you to listen and be supportive. If I'm not right, ladies, tell me. They don't want you to problem solve. I want you to learn because everything you know today is worthless in two years. Right? Technology changes quickly. That's not Microsoft. That's just technology. It's moving faster and faster and faster. The fundamental skill sets will you'll always be good for you. Um, how to problem solve, big O notation, uh, all those sorts of things. But, but exactly what's in MVC 3 is worthless because MVC 4.5 just shipped. Right? So I want someone who can learn because I don't want to hire someone who, who's a, a rocket scientist, a ninja with uh, jQuery today. Because a year from now, my, my company may need completely different skills, right? And so I want someone who's a web developer to learn whatever framework comes out, whatever becomes important. And so I want someone who can learn, not a one-trick a one pony. And passion. We do this for a living. I spend a lot of time working. And to me, because I'm passionate about technology, the line is very blurred between life and, and career. It's almost completely intermingled. And I think a lot of us are like that. It's great if you're not passionate about technology, you, you just work nine to five, you put in your time, you work hard. 
but you go home and you're passionate about something else like raising miniature unicorns or uh, basket weaving, uh, which I have a neighbor who does that, and, and stuff like that. That's totally cool. If you, you need to find your passion in life, but if it's not technology, I don't want you on my team. I only want people who show up to work in the morning and go, damn it, let's write some code, right? That's what I want. And uh, I love everyone else, that's great, but on my team, that's what I'm, I want all of us to be like that. So I've already talked about how everything will be worthless in two years. This is probably one of the most important slides in the deck. <laughs> I give this talk at junior highs. You would not believe how much they laugh at, oh my God, he said the word boob. <laughs> like uh, seven, six, seven, eighth graders. So you need to eat like a bird and poop like an elephant. And you probably are wondering what the heck that means. I didn't invent this. I'll tell you about it, who did in a second. Birds, and I'm not a biologist, so I'm just going to make some of this up. Birds eat a lot of food. They have a very high metabolism. Uh, they don't gain a lot of weight. They burn a lot of energy, so they're constantly consuming food all the time. Elephants, on the other hand, poop a lot. All over the place. And for us to be successful uh, in the careers that we have, and I think this applies to any career, you have to consume a lot of information from everyone, everywhere you go. Right? I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, because if I am, I'm either A, wrong, or B, not learning anything. Three, probably a jerk. So I want to consume as much information and knowledge as I can, and that's eating like a bird. And pooping like an elephant is sharing it with everyone everywhere. <laughs> I'm pooping on you right now. <laughs> I am paid by Microsoft to be a professional pooper. <laughs> and so uh, there's a great book called Rules for Revolutionaries, by Guy Kawasaki, who is probably the original evangelist as, a, as an actual job uh, for the original uh, Macintosh, actually. And, and he says, I poop, therefore I am. And the more I give away, the more trust I build, and the more influence I have, and the more uh, a power, if you will, that I have. In the old economy, before this internet thing happened, um, which is when AOL invented it, uh, not really. Uh, you know, it was about um, hoarding information and owning information and controlling the information. And if I had the control, I had the power, and you had to come ask me for that information. But now we've disintermediated, we've flipped that inside out. And now it's who shares information and becomes more powerful, right? And this has changed a lot of industries. Look at car dealerships, for example, who normally, they controlled all the information. They knew how much the car cost. They, they knew all the information about the different cars. And now you can look all that up online. And you can walk in and say, I know it's fair. This is the car I want. Let's make a deal. So you, the more you share, the more you trust other people, the more trust you will get and the more influence you will have. Manage your resume like source code. You should uh, keep it up to date all the time. And try not the job hop. Uh, in our industry, there's a lot of demand. Even though the economy around the world is pretty hard right now, there's still a lot of demand for IT, especially uh, SharePoint. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm, that's not a joke. I'm serious. There's a lot of demand for SharePoint. Uh, but so you're very tempted to job hop every three, six months getting a new job. And, uh, and just because you're getting more and more salary and you think you're... And this happened in the dot-com boom uh, in, the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And people were changing jobs so rapidly and they were going up kind of the career scale so quickly that when the crash happened, they were completely priced out of the market and they lost their jobs because they were too expensive. When I look at someone at their resume and they've job hopped like that, that says a lot of things to me. One, maybe they don't know how to finish a job. Maybe they don't know how to finish a project. Maybe they're hard to get along with. Maybe they escape a company before the problems that they've caused hurt them, right? Maybe that's not fair. Maybe that's not right. But when I'm looking at 10 resumes, I need ways to say no to get down to a couple before I can say yes. And one way is to say, look, if they job hop a lot, I'm going to hire him. He's probably going to be gone in six months. So why invest all that in, uh, effort into this person, this emotional uh, investment into this person if they're just going to leave soon? So have a story for every job on your resume. Not why you left. The boss was a jerk. I hated their source control management. There has to be good stories. And uh, really have that story. What would you tell your grandmother about that job? Right? It was great. I learned a lot about continuous integration. But, you know, I learned that I really was trying to, I wanted to focus more on automated testing. And they weren't doing that there. You can't say, I failed to show up for work for a week and they fired me. That just doesn't work. 
And I, how many of you, most of you probably do your resume in Word. Word has a feature to text when you're working on your resume and screws with it. Have you ever seen this? Like the bullets and the formatting and the margins. Oh my God, it's a nightmare. And I love Word besides that. So I keep all of this in a spreadsheet. And whenever I do something important, I add that to the spreadsheet. And I keep that updated. And I do this throughout the year. Every week I look back at my week and I add it to the spreadsheet. And then when it comes time to do my performance review or my resume, I go to the spreadsheet and pull that data in and massage it. Because what did you do a month ago? I don't, know. I don't even know what country I was in a month ago, let alone what I was doing, <laughs> right? So how would you know what you were doing a year ago when it comes to your performance review? I don't remember any of that. So I log it on, that just, just things to jog my memory. I copy and paste my performance review, and I, I'm done. And it helps me remember what I, what I was doing. But keep the resume up to date, especially a lot of companies, at least in the U.S., require that you keep your resume internally up to date as well uh, as you take new roles within the company and that sort of thing. So who knows who these are? Come on. Who? Can you the name? What show? Star Trek, that's right. They're the binars uh, because they, uh, they would speak in binary uh, with these little things attached to their heads. Does anyone know what season? Season one, episode 15. Uh, the title was 11001001. That was the name of the binars. This on the left is zero and on the right is one. And uh, don't ask me why I know that. <laughs> and, uh, and they come on the Starship Enterprise, and they're going to upgrade the computer systems. And, uh, and they're going to, but a crisis happens, uh, an unplanned crisis, I might add, happens while they're on the ship. And secretly, they're going to try to steal the ship. Picard doesn't know this, Picard being our hero. And they're like, oh, the ship's not ready. We can't go. And Picard's like, there's a crisis. We have to go. We have to save these people. And, uh, and they're like, we can't. And he goes, I don't care what you do, just make it work. And then they steal the ship and hilarity ensues. But have you ever heard that at work? I don't care what you do, just make it work. This means you have stopped communicating with the human appropriately. Communication is broke down, they don't understand you. You could just talk to Klingon to them or Binar. These guys sound like fax machines. And, um, and it's not working. So we have to learn how to communicate with humans. Right? We are in our own space with our own words, our own technology and terminology. And as we know, they don't care about technology. They care about the results. So we have to use the words that they use. If I'm working with a guy who manages a warehouse, a distribution center, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn his vocabulary and the things that he cares about. He cares about inventory turns. He cares about shrink, which is when things get stolen out of the, data center, uh, the distribution center. He cares about the licensing and training of the forklifts and all of those cool toys they have. Um, they're not toys. They shouldn't be played with. Um, those are the things they care about. So I, as a developer working for that part of the business, need to care about those things as well. And the, the more you use their vocabulary and their language, the more aligned with uh, the business they will feel you are, the more they will trust you. And then you'll be very successful in doing this. You will also learn more about the business and, and do better. And this takes practice. You would not believe how often my foot ends up in my mouth. Right, and uh, but it takes practice, and I work hard at it, and and I, I do better every time. Part of that is saying I don't know. As consultants or professionals, I think even people who work internally for their own company, they should treat themselves as consultants. We are we feel pressure to always say I know the answer to make up the answer. As speakers, we feel that pressure all the time that we should always have an answer. But you will never build trust and respect. If you just make up an answer, you will build more trust and respect with that person, with that business person, maybe. If you say, I don't know, but I will go look it up for you. What now, about saying, I don't remember? Yeah, you can say, I, 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 you can say, I don't remember. That's fine. Uh, any permutation on this you want to go with? <laughs> I didn't go that day to class for these guys up front. I, it doesn't matter. But cons I mean, I've had consultants who were told in training, never say, I don't know. Because yeah, we, that's we, why you can say, I don't yeah. remember. Okay, I see as an alternative, right? Because the, the company was afraid the customer would think they weren't professional enough and, and sharp enough. And I said, I, I think you're smarter saying you don't know because it's better to know what you don't know, right? And then you, you can show more respect and trusting. I will go figure that out because I'm smart. I can learn anything. And I will bring that back to you and, and figure it out. 
Very hard to do that. We have to use metaphors. This is a real sign from a park. We have to use metaphors, uh, examples, and, and, and so on when we're talking with humans to explain the concepts that we're trying to get across to them. Just like this sign is using pictographs to do that. So if you encounter a mountain lion, uh, which um, are dangerous, by the way, and uh, one op these are four options. One, face the lion and back away slowly. He has no feet. <laughs> or you can do the complete opposite, is be large and shout. So frankly, right here, this sign has not helped one bit. <laughs> then uh, keep your children close and pick your children up without bending. In the, U in the US, we have a government agency that their whole job is to make sure that people are able to be healthy in their work environment. Like, you should always lift with your knees and not your back. So that's what they're saying. Pick up your children so you don't hurt your back. <laughs> and, uh, and feel free to use them as a meat shield. The old saying we had in the dot-com world was, you don't have to run faster than the bear, just faster than your friend. <laughs> and if I'm ever being chased by zombies, I'm going to have a gun to shoot my friend. <laughs> it, just in the knee, not, not to kill him. That'll slow him down enough, because I'm not a fast runner, <laughs> and to get to my boat that I bought earlier. And then if you're attacked, go ahead and fight back. Because <laughs> as opposed to just laying there letting them eat you. <laughs> If they really hurt you, feel free to fight back. So this sign is actually kind of pointless. But, <laughs> but like, for example, I was in this conversation. The IT was like, we should, to the business, we should make web services to do that. And the business is like, I don't know what web services are. Uh, how does that, do you need a credit card? What is that? And I was like, look, you talk to a website with a web browser. Computers can talk to websites with web services. Oh, now I get it. All right, we can integrate. Yes, OK. So you need to come up with different ways to explain things beyond uh, just, uh, uh, just the technical jargon. This is also probably the, of the three most important slides in this deck, this is the second most important one in the deck. Do you remember what the first one was? The poop slide, right. So perception is reality. This is very hard for us because we're all Vulcans. We are very black and white, one and zero, true and false. And humans are 50 shades of gray. I was wondering if you guys would get that reference. <laughs> I have not read the book, though. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a story. It's about a fictional software company from the Pacific Northwest that makes an operating system. <laughs> this is the part of the show where I might get fired. <laughs> and this operating system would copy files from one place to another when the user asked to do so, usually with some esoteric keyboard shortcut. And, uh, and we've been doing this, I'm sorry, they've been doing this for a long, long time. And the code to copy and paste, to copy files, had not evolved or changed a lot since early days of disk operating system softwares. And, but the world had changed a lot. You would now copy over the internet. You would now copy over very fast networks, very large files, very vast numbers of files versus 20 years ago when the original software was written. So we thought when the new software for Windows Vista came out, we would rewrite the copy and paste um, algorithms and make it modern and make it better um, beyond the whole guessing how long it's going to take the copy thing, which that guy should have been fired. <laughs> and, and, and so it was brilliant. It was great. It was awesome code. It really, trust me, Vista RTM, the copy paste code algorithms were fantastic. How many of you feel that I am lying? Right, if you had Vista RTM, you would go to copy something, and it seemed like it would take twice as long as XP, which is now like 11 years old, by the way. So it turns out it was better. We just stopped lying to you, in X, which should be a good thing. In XP, we would start the copy process, and once the reading of the source file was done and in the buffer, and we start writing the buffer to disk on the other end, as soon as it was all in the buffer, we would shut down the UI and quietly write the file out in the background. <laughs> right? We were lying to you. We're done when we're not done. <laughs> so in Vista, we said, we will keep the UI up the whole time. So now you're seeing the in and the out of the buffer. And that's what made it feel like it was twice as long. 
but perception is reality. If people say file copying in Vista is slower than XP, that is our reality, and we have to deal with it. If someone says you are arrogant, hard to work with, deal with it. If, you're, if they say your software is slow or hard to use, deal with it as it is your reality, even if you think it is the best ever. So in Service Pack 1, we fixed it. Do you know how we fixed it? <laughs> that, that's not the joke yet. We just started lying to you again. We said, all right, you want to be lied to, I understand. That's how some relationships are. And so we just started, uh, we turned the UI off once the buffer was filled. And, and everyone was happy, and everyone loved Vista. And we're on to eight now. So this is now the third uh, most important slide in the deck. Everything else is just filler for the hour. Feel, felt, found. This is a pattern of language that will change your life. This is how humans like to be communicated to. And as you learn it better in English, I don't know what it would be in Bulgarian or whatever. Um, I understand how you feel. Someone has a problem. Maybe it's not with you. Maybe it's with the Vista file copy. I understand how you, we're going to be friends now, okay? I understand how you feel. I'm aligning with you. I feel the same way. I have empathy for you. That's the first stage. So we've, we've built that bond. Others have felt the same way. You're not alone. You're not on an island. You're not weird or strange. Other people feel the same about Vista file copy or whatever. And what they have found is, and then you fill in the solution. So understand how you feel. Others have felt the same way. And what they have found is, I'm going to help you find the solution with you together, and we'll solve it. This solves a lot of problems uh, when you're talking to, to humans. Now, uh, a couple years ago, my wife came with me to a conference, and she saw this talk. And then a week later, I said, I, honey, I understand how you feel. And she said, stop right there. <laughs> but as simple as this is, see, uh, many of us have disdain for salespeople because that's just fun. But they really are. Like, we're naturally good at technology. They are naturally good with communi communicating with humans, with building those relationships. That's what they do. They don't even know how they do it. And a, one of the, my sales guys at my company taught me this. He goes, feel, felt, found. Because I was struggling with how to get a customer over a problem. And, and I tried it, and it was spooky weird how well it worked. And as you, the more and more you use it, it'll become part of how you communicate. And then you can use different permutations if you want, right? So understand how you feel. Others have felt the same way. And, and what they have found is if they focus more on unit testing, they will get higher quality software, whatever, whatever the answer is, right? I'm trying to think of, we've got a few more minutes. And I'm trying to think of a, a couple other slides that I took out because, I again, this, this talk is normally much, much longer. Oh, uh, always hold the door. So uh, this is not just being polite, but it, it shows a lot of respect. So I have this complicated algorithm in my head. When I'm at a door and there's someone behind me, of when I should hold the door or not. How close are they to me? Are they too far away? Is it raining or is it not? Are they carrying a lot of stuff or not? Those sorts of things. And uh, I had a friend, he was going to interview for a job. And he was going into the, uh, the company for the interview. And he was showing up uh, a bit early, which is one of my other things, is you should, the, the farther you have to travel to a meeting, the earlier you should be there. So down the hall, be five minutes early, because people are going to ask you to fix their printer. Uh, if it's across town, be 30 minutes early. If you have to fly uh, you know, from US to Europe, for example, you should get in at least the day before. So he was getting there early, and this, this lady was coming in after him, and it was raining out. And so he held the door for three or four seconds while she was coming up the walkway and in. And he told the receptionist, I'm here for my interview with blah, blah, blah. She said, great, sit there for a minute. She, he goes up for the interview, and it's the lady he held the door for. And he got the job. Another time I was in New Jersey on the project, designing technology that will let you choose the color of chicken, um, which I'll tell in a second of why that's important. And I was leaving my hotel that I was living at for six, six months. And oh, and I often got the room a 404. And I would go down to the receptionist and say, was it room 404? And they're like, yeah. And I go, I can't find it. And they never got the joke. 
so I, it was a snow, New Jersey uh, can get quite snowy and icy in the winter. There had been a storm. And I was in town, actually. The uh, uh, big boss who had the budget was coming in from uh, uh, Switzerland to discuss if they were going to extend our contract. And I needed to get this contract. This is during the downturn, after the dot-com crash. If I didn't get this contract extension, 10 people on my team were going to get laid off because we didn't have the money, and, and it was right before Christmas, so no pressure at all. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm dressed nice. I, I've got everything in my head of how to talk to humans and, and body language and all that stuff, and I'm ready to, for the game. And I go out, and there's a snowstorm, and this lady is stuck in the, in the parking lot, and her car is stuck in the ice. So I help her get her car unstuck. Um, again, I grew up in a, in a snowy environment. But I slipped, and I, I cut my chin, and I, got, I, I was bleeding and stuff like that. So she said, thank you, and I went inside, and I cleaned up, and I was 15 minutes late to the meeting. And it turned out she was the lady that I had to pitch the project to, that I had helped her, because she had flown in and stayed in the same hotel. And we ended up getting the extension. So the story ended nice, but you never know that little good deed that you do. I don't know if you call it karma or whatever. It, I, I believe, will come back and, and help you out. So holding the door, uh, always being polite, uh, always remembering... Uh, who's in the room when you're talking, or who might be behind you uh, when you're talking. <laughs> so the, this project we worked on uh, is a company that made nutritional food for animal growers. So if you're going to grow a chicken farm or whatever, not you don't grow the farm, you grow chickens on the farm. And, uh, and people have a cultural preference for the color of the skin of the chicken. So people in very northern latitudes, and so... Uh, Canada, uh, uh, Sweden, that sort of thing, they expect very pale skin chicken, uh, almost white like paper, because of what the chicken naturally eats in their environment um, leads to that. And so as we've evolved as humans over the past couple of years and you go to the store to buy chicken, you expect the chicken to have white skin. And if you're in southern latitudes, think uh, Italy and Mexico and so on, especially in Mexico, the chickens will eat um, certain flowers that give them a very yellow color to the chicken uh, skin. So when a Mexican goes into a store and they go to buy a chicken, they expect it to be yellow. When someone from Canada goes into the store, they expect the chicken to be white. And so if you're raising 50,000 chickens to sell, you have to make sure you have the right color chicken for the right market. And this is not chemicals. This is natural, healthy uh, things that are in the food. But you have to tune the, nutri the nutrition package. So we developed software that let you have, you know when you go to the store to pick out a paint color and they have this big paint fan of all the colors, right? And I only know eight colors, but there's like 250 colors. We made that for chicken. And you could pick between zero and 255 for the color of the chicken you want, and we would reverse engineer that to the nutritional package you had to feed the chicken to get that color. And we could be pretty precise on that, depending on the breed of chicken and all of that. It was kind of crazy, actually. <laughs> So then we did the same thing for salmon, because uh, wild salmon is very reddish pink, like these chairs you're sitting on. Um, and a farm-raised salmon, if they're just fed random food, just fish food, will be gray, which is not very salmon-y, right? <laughs> when you have a color named after the fish, you should probably make it that color. So we, we had about 200 colors of salmon you could pick, from gray to, to real red. And again, that's just purely based on what they eat in the environment. Uh, natural stuff that they pick up. So I wanted to branch out. I want to say, look, could we have a uh, green salmon, blue chicken? And there was no interest at all in blue chicken in the market. <laughs> uh, there's only one food that's naturally blue. Does anyone know what it is? Blueberries, Blueberries yeah. It's a really easy trivia question. <laughs> um, never burn a bridge when you leave a job. And uh, it's very tempting. Your last day of the job, you're mad at the stupidity of these people that you're leaving, and uh, you've, you've already broken emotionally, and you're going to go to the new job, and you just want to destroy them. Teach them the errors of their ways and, and rip them apart. But it's amazing how often you will meet those people later on in your career. <laughs> so uh, I had a, a customer. Uh, he was late in his career. He was in his 60s, and his company was getting bought by a guy that he burned his bridge with 30 years ago that he used to work for. He left his job. He got really angry with them. There was a lot of bad blood. He goes off and starts his own company and grows it. 
And, uh, and later, the, the old boss is buying his company. And, uh, and so you always want to be very careful of that, too. It's very small. Our community, no matter where you are in the world, is very small. You will meet the same people over and over and over again. And you don't want to uh, create bad blood, because everyone is different as they uh, mature and age and learn new skills and, and those sorts of things. And, and I guess the, the last thing I want to say, because uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time and you want to go get a good seat for the raffle, is never take another job for the money. Your first job out of school, totally do it for the money. <laughs> After that, never take a job for money. Because if you're, you, you're unhappy and you want the more money, and you're going to go there, uh, but you may be tricked into taking the wrong job that doesn't support your career. So you should take the job because it supports your career. The money is a separate concern. You should know whether you want the job because it supports your career before they make the offer, before they tell you how much money, benefits, and uh, you know, what uh, you know, pool house you're going to get and cars and all of that sort of stuff. So you, you should know for the job, does it support my career? Is it something I want to do? And then you're going to resign. And, and unfortunately, I don't know the job market here as well, but I know in the US, very often, your current employer will give you a counter offer. Oh, you're leaving, that, that's great, but we really love you. We'll give you a raise if you stay. We'll give you more money to stay. And, and statistically, that never works out because you've already broken emotionally with the company and you're already ready to move on. And this is just gonna drag it out maybe another 12 months. And if they really loved you that much, they should have been paying you that much to begin with, right? So they were just going cheap on you. And they know that you're gonna leave soon. And so that just gives them time to replace you before you leave. So statistically, uh, I think it's 85% of the people that, in the US at least, that take a counter offer to stay end up leaving within 12 months. So you should never make a counter offer, you should never accept a counter offer because it's just not gonna work out. So, uh, we're ending maybe five minutes early. Does anyone have any questions whatsoever? No, because as soon as I say done, you're all gonna come down with questions. I know how it works. All right, well, thank you for sticking out to the last session of the conference, I appreciate it. Thank all the sponsors that helped make DevReach possible. It wouldn't happen without them. I wanna thank you for coming to this session and let's go win some crap.